Museum Digit 2020. A Magyar Nemzeti Múzeum online virtuális konferenciája. So welcome to Museum Digit 2020, the virtual online conference organized by OMIC, the uh, National Center for Museological Methodology and Information, which is a department of the Hungarian National Museum in Budapest. Uh, my name is Victoria Ivan, and we have a special treat for you among our digital pioneers. So if you can imagine that it, we can see a painting and not only see it, but feel it, hear it and sense it, what would you do? And what would you do if you could see all the objects, some of the most spectacular in human history, and you could jump around between continents, times, and cultures? And what about if you could see some underdrawings on, so on uh, Leonardo's masterpieces? What would you say? Well, we have the man behind this spectacular project and many others, Chris Michaels, Director of Digital Communications and Technology at the National Gallery in London. It's great to have you with us, Chris. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. So just in a few words, tell us what your title means. Um, so I'm uh, an executive director at the National Gallery in London, where I look after a whole range of business areas from digital, which is my personal special specialization, to communications, marketing, public affairs, public relations, uh, creative, what everything looks like in the gallery, IT, making sure everything works, making sure people can work from home uh, in this year of all years, uh, and uh, commercial services. So ticketing, membership, how we make money from our audiences as they come into the gallery. So very broad be brief, but uh, my personal specialism is digital and how it's changing museums and, and the cultural sector. So you're quite a renaissance man, and this is not your first job in the museum sector. Your first job was in the British Museum, and that, as I referred to, you had a great, uh, great uh, uh, project for the Museum of the World with Google Arts. And when you joined uh, uh, the National Gallery, one of your galleries wrote a letter in which they called you dangerous. So what, what was it? Was it the British Museum project, or what gave him the idea that he would be dangerous? Uh, well, you know, uh, you don't you don't have to always be popular to do your job well. Uh, digital is one of those things that is changing museums, and uh, I try to approach that in a kind of pr practical way more than anything else to try mm -hmm. to see what people do uh, in the technology sector, whether that's you know people like Google, uh, whether that's people in the public sector and just try and apply some of that logic to, uh, to museums. And that means shifting some things, sometimes things that people have cared about a lot for a very long time. So, uh, you know, some, sometimes change uh, can always be a kind of happy, positive process and sometimes it hurts. And so I guess uh, something I did uh, hurt somebody. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that on a personal level, but uh, you know, you, you, if you want to evolve, uh, sometimes you just gotta do the right thing rather than the thing that makes everyone happy. Was your mindset so different from what is usually you can see in the museum field? Well, it's, I mean, that these, these things can't, won't always come together easily. You know, the museum's 260 years old, the National mm -hmm. is 195 years old. So, and some of the kind of ways of doing things sometimes, you know, go right back to the heart, to the origins of those organizations. You know, the internet's only 30 years old and most of the way that we do things uh, in digital are less than 10 years old. So sometimes mm -hmm. things kind of just, just come together in a, in a slightly messy way. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, evolution always has to happen. It's always happening all the time. But, uh, you know, so sometimes I said it comes with, with bumps and spikes. And that's, mm -hmm. that's fine. And did you find that people had a lot of prejudice and preconceptions as far as the digital was concerned? Did they had a lot of myths on false beliefs so that you had to get away with? Uh, I think what's happened in the way museums have thought about digital has been very much from a collections point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's grown out of, you know, digitizing your collection, uh, how you think about the sharing of kind of collections data. That's a very important area. Mm -hmm but it's not the only area. Uh, for me, the other areas are actually more about social media, how you talk to the public, mm -hmm. uh, more about you know, things like uh, data and analytics, which is really the, the, the kind of discipline I try to, to build in museums more than anything. So kind of how you listen to visitors, how you understand their behaviors, uh, and how you grow your audience and how you make money for it. Uh, and so 
it's more about realizing the breadth of what digital mm -hmm. change means rather than just uh, uh, a kind of uh, a kind of attitude against digital per se there's a there's a huge love of digitization mm -hmm. there may not be as much love of overall as kind of you know digital storytelling uh, social mm -hmm. media the, the things that the rest of the world all care about as, as digital all, all the time every day those bits to me that uh, museums have got to kind of embrace. Because digitization is only the first step. It's sharing and distributing the content, which makes it really valuable, right? That's right. I mean, di digitization of collections has huge value internally to institutions, mm -hmm. has huge value to a small group of academics who mm -hmm. need that data for their work, but doesn't uh, have a huge impact for massive audiences. You know, none of us sit at home at night and kind of look at museum websites to look at all the collections they have. It's just not. It's just not what something people do. You know, they look at, they watch Netflix, uh, yeah. TikTok on their phones. That's what people do, and we've got to make museums part of that digital behaviour as well as that as as well as being meaningful to an academic audience. That's super important that you point it out because this is something that we struggle with both inside the organisation and both outside. And uh, did you make uh, changes in the uh, structure of the National Gallery to have your team built up of storytellers, social media managers, and everyone who helps you with this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it, it, it's a core part of the kind of organisational changes I made, both at the, at the British Museum and here, was, as you say, to, to make sure that you had people who were great at digital storytelling mm -hmm. at, at the heart of the organisation, who could work alongside those other great storytellers, you know, mm -hmm. the curators, the exhibitions people, the designers, who tell stories in different mediums and try and let them work together. So, you know, that that that's fundamental to me. Disciplines like video production, you know, mm -hmm. there's a there's a billion stories to tell lurking inside every museum. So, if you can kind of get someone who can point the camera at the right person at the right time and tell the mm -hmm. story. You know, there's never never been easier ways to distribute that story to lots of people. So storytellers have to be at the heart of it. But ultimately, people who care about the audience, mm -hmm. you know, that for me has really been the thing is kind of saying quite uh, over and over again that the audience is as important as the collection. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, they both need to matter as much as each other. Uh, and for digital people, that's often very intuitive. You can't do anything online without caring about the audience. So. Um, you know, people who just want to hear and, and, and reflect what the audience wants as much as they want to reflect on what the collection is. Although you're not fighting with the low visitor numbers. I mean, visitor numbers were extraordinary at the National Gallery, right? So you had more than almost 7, billion, uh, 7 million visitors per year, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I have a very odd sense of museums in that the two I've worked in are both inside the 10 most popular in the world. So, you know, both the National Gallery and the British Museum about six million people a year, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. But this year, maybe only a million in total. Oh. Places, you know, the, uh, being closed for uh, three and a half months, you know, the constraints on visitorship after reopening. Uh, you know, I, I think these will be the lowest visitor numbers we've had since uh, at least the 1940s and probably the 1850s. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's, you know, no, in, a, a kind of incredible and difficult moment. Mm -hmm. The other side, our digital audience has nearly doubled over this period. So, you know, we can reach hundreds of millions of people uh, through the things we do online. And that's got to become ever more critical to the gallery's own sense of, of who it is. Did you have to rewrite your digital strategy because of the COVID? Uh, I refuse to ever really write the strategies down on paper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of paragraphs, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yes, I mean, it, we're, we're going through a process of strategic redefinition now, and the core of that will be recognising that, as I said, our, our audience has nearly doubled in two months. Mm -hmm. months. Uh, you know, we can keep on growing it. You know, there are audiences coming to museum digital content who've never come before, partly because they can't go to museums, partly because we're all doing so much more storytelling. So, you know, thinking about how we can really grow the pool, you know, and reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mm -hmm. million people uh, has, has to be the kind of strategic principle behind it. But uh, I would counsel everyone, don't don't write long strategy documents. Uh -huh. It's not worth it. Because then things like COVID come along and you just have to rip it up. So it's, a, it's kind of a waste of time. Um, so true. So true. But anyone who hasn't seen your website, it's really worth looking at it, either because of the storytelling, which I've seen that you reworked, 
I, I, I listened to a talk and it uh, talks about the process of how you revise the text uh, next to the paintings. And during the COVID, you also had a section dedicated to meditation or mindfulness or some kind of a, a new section that, were, that introduced paintings in a very new light. So, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, uh, going into lockdown uh, in March uh, was, a, was a kind of crazy time and we had to work out how to do video production as a, you know, something we do every day, not in the gallery, but remotely. So what it became a chance to do, one was to do more, to kind of ramp up the amount we could do, because of course that's the only way people were gonna get contact with the gallery, but also to do different things. Mm -hmm. A series about mm -hmm. mindfulness uh, was, a, was an experiment. We, you know, we wanted to see if people liked it. Uh, and the truth is they really, really liked it. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it becomes one of those kind of new types of storytelling where you, you realise that you can get different value from the art for a slightly different audience. You know, we've always, we've always thought that the gallery was a great place for kind of contemplation and mm -hmm. possibly meditation in a more formal sense. But, you know, this, this kind of proves it really. And this is not only an experiment, but you're also famous for using data and insight in your digital activities like do you yeah. measure these uh, uh, numbers too like very strictly yeah. everything is strictly measured and based on data that you do yeah so i mean as, as i said it's not it's not really about in a way it's not really about the use of data for its own sake it's about listening to the audience mm -hmm. and the ways to listen to the audience one is the individual voice of individual people so qualitative qualitative research and two is kind of data analysis and where you see the behaviors of large numbers of people and what they do. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of fundamental to how I want us to work as a gallery and how our digital groups work is being able to provide data and, and analysis to people, both through, you know, it, what people say, but also through analysis of what they do. So ev everything comes with, you know, a, a, a deep range of reporting that supports it. Uh, and, you know, our our board, our directors, our trustees, and our you know they're extremely used to the kind of insight that we can provide, and it helps us hopefully make better decisions about what we do. And everyone at the National Gallery is convinced of the importance of the digital. So it's not like a silo that's built independently and does only communication, but it's a, so the curators and everyone is conscious of that this has to be distributed and this has to be engaging. Uh, I think I think so. I mean, I, I, I can't speak for every single person, um, but, you know, it's it's one of the fundamental pillars of our strategy as an organisation. And, you know, COVID as a period where the things that you would normally do in a museum, you can't do, you know, mm -hmm. the talks, the exhibitions, you know, has has definitely reinforced to people that mm -hmm. you do all of this in mm -hmm. form online. You know, like last week we ran a... Uh, talk uh, by the curator of our new Artemisia Gentileschi exhibition that usually would be 200 people in a lecture theatre. Mm -hmm. Did it as an online talk and it was a thousand people paying for a ticket to come to see it online. And, you know, that kind of transition from the physical world to the digital world has worked in most cases very smoothly. You know, you do it on the same as we're talking wow. now. It's not massively technically complicated. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you can serve bigger or diff uh, more diverse audiences as a result. So, at this point, it's it, it's a kind of win-win situation, really. And also, when you talk about digital, you once said in an interview that you don't want to put any more screens in an exhibition room that all that are already there. So, for you, technology doesn't mean like an, an excess of high tech and innovations. Yeah. In I mean, we're we're again, it's it's a slight side effect of the museums I've worked in, right? British Museum and National Gallery are full of some of the most famous and important things in human history. You know, the Rosetta Stone, mummies, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh. Uh, the horrible thing with screens is if I put a screen next to Van Gogh's sunflowers with the football results on it, people would look at the football results. Uh -huh. Not because it's better, but because, because it moves, mm -hmm. it kind of catches your eye differently. And that would, you know, take so much away from uh, uh, from the experience. I just, I, I just don't want to do that. I think it's mm -hmm. the worst thing we can do. You know, being in a room with stuff, the, you know, the amazing objects museums holds. That's a, you know, a, 
a kind of fundamental human experience. We look at screens all the time. Like we're doing it now. We do it all the time, all day, every day. Why do it when you're in a room with a Van Gogh or a mummy? Like just get, get the screens out of the way. But everything else around it, you can shape through digital, except when you're in front of the thing itself. Yeah. But in what ways can the digital enhance and deepen the experience? What is it that the digital does very well then? Uh, so for me, it's, it, it's, it's the wrapper. It's what I call the wrapper of the experience, right? So mm -hmm. it's the bit before where you're planning to come to a museum and, you know, you have a brilliant, precise on booking process online, tells you what you need to do, gives you information, upsells you to donations, uh, gets you to buy a catalogue and gets you a good, you know, a, a nice process to get through the door. It's, you know, things like wayfinding. You know, how do you find your way through a museum, which is by its nature a, a slightly chaotic kind of place. Uh, and then it's the relationship afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the quality of email and social media that kind of builds a relationship with you over time. Uh, and, you know, for us, hopefully makes you a member or kind of come, come back again. And for you, gets you a kind of ever deepening mm -hmm. knowledge and understanding of the stuff. Mm -hmm. But that, that's what digital's for. Uh, it's not for, I said, kind of, I, there's places like, you know, science museums, some of the places you kind of have to have digital installations like that, I totally get it, but uh, I, I I don't think it's for the main kind of gallery experience in a place like the National Gallery. Except for when you talked about AR, VR and MR, which when you said that it, the immersive experience can give us the context, which should the, uh, the museums by definition deprive us of. So it can put us back in the era, in the culture, yeah. from where the object comes from, or the painting. Yeah. I mean, I think those are moments in museums, and, prob and probably they'll end up moments not in museums, in you know shopping centres and other places where the chance to kind of have have a kind of in immersive moment is important. And so we will do it. We are doing it in exhibitions. We did Leonardo. Yeah exhibition last year, we're doing a Gossart ex uh, immersive exhibition this year. There are kind of moments where it's the right thing to do, uh, you know, and then, then do it as brilliantly as you can do it. But I, I said, I think that the, the general act of kind of looking at art in a room, you, you don't need the intervention in. Can you elaborate on the right moment? Like, wh what do you call the right moment? Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll take an example of the, uh, the Gossart exhibition we run in, we'll run in December. So Gossart's Adoration of the Kings is this kind of wildly kind of complex kind of uh, world that he's created where uh, the, the, the kind of baby Jesus at the middle is just a kind of context where this whole kind of vi vision of, uh, kind of Jerusalem comes out. And it's so kind of phenomenally detailed that looking at the painting itself, actually you, you barely get it, you can barely get time or sense to look at it. So digital becomes a kind of jump off point through <coughs> immersive experience into like all of the depth and detail of that. Mm -hmm. There's a way to kind of explode out of the picture into, into the world it creates. It was the same thing for us with Leonardo's uh, Virgin of the Rocks, the, the exhibition we did last year. You know, there's so much going on in the Leonardo in a way, just, just the act of looking at the picture in a way can never be enough. You need to kind of immerse yourself in the kind of the huge kind of intellectual universe that an artistic universe that Leonardo created. And we can build that out, you know, uh, and things like the under the under drawings that, that you mentioned, you can't see those with the naked eye. You need technology mm -hmm. to, to see them. So there's a chance to bring out the kind of the unseen inside the pictures as well. You know, one, one of the things that's a huge opportunity with things like mixed reality is, is to kind of see the unseen. You know, mm -hmm. pictures are more than just what's on the surface. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff going on underneath. You know, we have Rembrandt paintings with completely different pictures kind of sketched underneath them uh, you know things that the artist kind of took in took out or that history has kind of removed or destroyed so you know there's a there's an amazing chance to kind of get get better under mm -hmm. get better experience of the artwork in, in all its possibilities from it for me it means a very genuine very authentic connection to the artwork itself which you know a museum label could replace i think with no no matter how much research there is on a, a certain piece of artwork this immersive experience this very direct uh, contact can give back so i think that do you think because i was thinking that some people you know have this uh, threshold fear of museums that they are not educated enough they don't know enough about a certain era or an artist 
and it keeps them back. It somehow makes a barrier between them and the artwork. So do you think digital overcomes this barrier by immersing them? Or am uh, I just overthinking digital? <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully. I mean, uh -huh. it, uh, I, mean the, I think the, the, the practical kind of market truth of it is, is that there was until COVID an emerging market for digital immersive experiences in mm -hmm. a range of kind of cult areas, you know, entertainment, things derived from films, uh, you know, computer games, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, it's all been slightly disrupted by the last six months, but there is unquestionably a kind of a young audience that is interested in that stuff that may not be interested in museum exhibitions in their, in their classic. Mm -hmm. So if you can use that, as a way to get a different audience to come through, great. You know, we saw that with Leonardo, a kind of a, a bump up in the young audience attending. Uh, and I think that that's got to be part of the motivation for it. Uh, you know, plus, plus a chance to tell better the story of the things that we know about pictures in our case, or, uh, you know, ob objects in other, in other people's sense. So, but I mean, how it all comes back after COVID, we wait to see, you know, the visitor numbers are so suppressed. So, We'll wait and see what happens. So can I ask you about your vision? Because I would also like to ask you about NGX, your experimentation laboratory that you set up with the King's College London. So yeah, do you have well, visions of the future or the COVID just threw it uh, all out? Well, I mean, uh, the, the reason, so National Gallery X is an innovation lab that I set up uh, in September last year uh, with King's College London, one of the, the main universities in London. And the reason for it was people kept asking me that question. Uh, what's your vision of the future? And I, and, uh, and I always refuse to answer it, which is that, you know, clearly, I mean, COVID kind of proves anyone tries to predict what the future looks like is an mm -hmm. idiot. Get it wrong all the time, right? Uh, and so people are always asking me, you know, what's the National Gallery going to be like in 10 years' time? Uh, and my answer is I have no idea. But um, uh, let's kind of find a space to kind of think out loud about what it looks like and to get much smarter people than me to kind of experiment there. So what, what we try and do there is bring kind of artists, uh, research technology, researchers from, uh, from King's College, you know, curators and specialists from the gallery to kind of come together and think about the future. So uh, whether that's about how mi mixed reality art might work or whether that's about how augmented reality might help you kind of uh, do exhibitions out on the streets or, Whatever that is, we're, doing, we're about to do something very cool with, with robotics. Um, you know, you, the future comes from experimenting now rather than kind of, it's better to do than to think. So uh, it's a space to kind of do stuff and find out what, what the cool things for the future might look like. Uh, and then I don't have to answer the question. So it's more about the problems, not about the answers at this point. Yeah, stage. that's right. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's research and development in its, in its formal sense. So, uh, you know, what, what we try and do is kind of prototype something and then find other contexts to use it in. So we prototyped an augmented reality app for um, uh, a thing we were doing in, uh, in the gallery. And now we're using that for an exhibition on the streets of London next, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, in a different way. So again, you never quite know when you start something what it's really going to be useful for, uh, but then you kind of, you do it and then you find out as you go along. I would also be curious about how you would how you would define innovation because I realize that some people just use use it on a spectrum. For some people, putting a screen in the exhibition room is innovation, or you certainly at the National Gallery it's on a different level, on a different scale. What would you call an innovation? Well, I mean, it, it's an area of, of big interest to me is to, is really to recognize that arts organizations have a role to play in innovation in its formal sense. So. If you, if you kind of look at it as, a, as an economic area, uh, innovation is all about change and how it creates new economic growth, right? That's, that's kind of how, how governments think about it. And the trouble is uh, that people like museums aren't really thought of as being part of that process. You know, you're not really part of the technology sector. You're not really part of kind of industrial innovation. And I think we have a huge role to play as kind of creative organizations to help shape how innovation and change both in society and in the economy works. So, you know, for me, it's about us kind of playing a, playing a part in how things change. You know, te technology companies, particularly as they think about kind of, you know, really scary stuff like artificial intelligence really need the arts because the arts is so kind of divergent in the way it thinks about the world. 
to be participants in it. And so we really need to kind of engage hard with kind of technological innovation, uh, research innovation, and, and like make sure that the things that art helps you think about help shape what tomorrow's kind of technology and, and business looks like. Oh, yeah, I'm looking very much forward to seeing these cooperations and collaborations between the different sectors. And as a final question, as opposed to this, I'd like you to imagine yourself being a digital director of a very small museum with limited uh, means and uh, with a financial fund. What would you do? Uh, I, I, I actually get asked this question a lot by, by small museums. I mean, I, and I, <laughs> I always answer the same thing, which is, you need you, you're going to need to probably choose between two things mm -hmm. one is digital as a way to make money uh you know sell tickets better do your digital marketing better get more people to come uh you know run your databases uh, or build your brand through storytelling you know really engage with social media uh tell stories as as brilliantly as you can and kind of go for the longer term of, of, of trying to kind of participate as a kind of global digital storyteller. It's quite difficult to do both because you kind of need two people. Mm -hmm. And the person who's good at doing both things, they're, they're kind of like a different person. Uh, and so you've got to decide what your priorities are, but either you've got to be, you know, either start by getting good at storytelling or start by getting good at kind of digital marketing data and, uh, and, and kind of getting people to come. Pro probably you should do the storytelling bit but probably in a kind of post covid world where everyone's budgets are completely hammered uh, you, you probably have you may want to do the other bit but they're the two sides of it and you know if you if you look at the, the national gallery the two new departments i've created really in in three years is a digital department that's really good at storytelling and a commercial department that's really good at making money so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing it at a slightly bigger museum, the same thing of trying to kind of take, take those two tasks on, but recognizing they're not really the same thing. They are, they're different from each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I hope that this will give the nudge, the final nudge to museums who haven't done this before. And thank you so much, Chris, for being with us and sharing your ideas and, think, and thoughts about this. I think it was very important to point out that Big institutions are just as hardly hit by the COVID as small ones, even if their uh, budgets are much higher, unimaginably higher than small ones. Right. Real, real pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.